All right, so um, the checks that you guys just went through, again, you need to be fluent in those. That's um, so much of the test is going to look at the idea of counterbalancing power. Um, so obviously, if that's a theme, then where most of that counterbalancing power lies is within the three branches. Um, and what you should have with the executive branch, just to kind of quickly scroll through it, was the other end of advice and consent. Again, if the um, power of advice and consent can allow the Senate to check the judicial branch, it can also allow uh, it to check the president because the nominees come from the president. Uh, there are also other things that, you know, advice and consent covers, treaties and the budget. Um, in each case, um, you know, you should have some examples of how effective this is. The thing that I tried to stress yesterday is when the minority party is cloture proof, um, they have used the power to announce their intention to filibuster as a way to stall judicial nominees, and that's been a really contentious issue. Um, presidential selection, the, um, you know, we talked about in case of a tie, the, and there have been historic cases of that, like with, uh, um, Andrew Jackson um, and John Quincy Adams. There's other, you know, great examples of the um, the House and, and you know, there, excuse me, there are other examples of winning the popular vote but losing the uh, electoral vote. But this is a rather famous one that gets thrown in the House of Representatives. We talked about the corrupt bargain yesterday. Um, this is a rarity that they would actually kind of break those ties. Usually there's kind of a clarity at least in terms of the electoral vote, um, but there is that power. And, and again, you can assuage as to how significant it is. Um, presidential uh, vacant, uh, vice presidential vacancy and presidential disability is covered under the 25th. You hopefully had that. Um, we talked about the override, and what you had here is from Andrew Jackson on, presidents used it um, with increasing kind of numbers, you see, Obviously, FDR jumps out at you. Um, and rarely is it overwritten. Uh, Congress has a hard enough time getting a, a majority vote get, uh, together, let alone the, the two-thirds that they need to override. So you don't see overrides, uh, you know, much at all. Um, that doesn't mean it's not an effective check, because again, as I've said like 16 times, the threat of using it um, maybe enough to get the president and Congress to begin to work behind the scenes uh, to reach some sort of compromise. Okay. Um, we talked about impeachment, and we've only got three exam examples there. Uh, the examples are a bit of a mixed bag in terms of uh, whether or not it was used to curb abuse or whether or not it was used in a partisan fashion. Um, but it certainly is a significant power. Um, I, I think the fact that you have the ability to remove you know, regardless of whether you use it or not, is, is fairly significant. Um, the ones that you may have had a little tricky time with was the legislative veto um, and then the War Powers Act, because those are, you know, more so modern developments that um, we have to look at the constitutionality of. A legislative veto, again, is where Congress, strike, you know, the, the executive branch can act unilaterally. The president can direct departments and agencies via executive orders, um, through normal kind of administrative procedures to, you know, uh, carry out policy in a certain way. If Congress doesn't like it, it has lawmaking ability. So the question is, can they use that lawmaking ability to negate something that an executive branch or agency is doing? Uh, in the case of INS versus Chada, where um, Congress was trying to overrule what the Attorney General and the Immigration and Naturalization Service was doing with some poor guy named Jagdish Chada who was caught up in the middle. Um, what the Supreme Court ruled is no, the legislative branch can't interfere with normal executive functions. Um, there's no constitutional language for it. It's uh, a violation of the separation of powers. So they struck down uh, the legislative veto. Just because they struck it down doesn't mean it's not continually used though. Something In order for something to be unconstitutional, you gotta have to kind of call them on it each time. So, for example, um, you know, the um, courts have worked out, by and large, what they mean by a separation of church and state. And yet you often see 
you know, it could be at graduation ceremonies, it could be at other public functions, you know, uh, events starting with a prayer. You might be, you know, you might point out, well, wait a minute, I thought that that was unconstitutional. If your expectation is every time something, uh, if there's something that's unconstitutional, that it should be negated immediately, you'd need the justices there continually, right? Saying, yeah, that one's, that one fits under this kind of case. So the justices can't be at every graduation, every public function where there's a potential prayer. What you need is a complainant who is willing to bring that case uh, to the Supreme Court, and the court needs to hear it, and they need to affirm that, yeah, that instance matches what we were talking about with this other case. Long story short, Congress continues to use legislative vetoes, and as long as the executive branch doesn't call them on it, they get away with it. And it's kind of the similar case with the War Powers Act, but in reverse. In other words, Congress has this power to be able to check the president, but rarely do they uh, use it. And therefore, the president continues to have that power to wage war, right? Um, in your warm-up, uh, hopefully you did kind of try to remember the three provisions that are set up in the War Powers Act. There's notification. What's the uh, Try not to look at it. What's the catch? President sends troops. What are his restrictions in terms of sending troops? How soon does he have to notify, and what's the catch? Yeah, that when possible, and that's the, you know, with all deliberate speed clause. That's the one that kind of kills um, the idea, because how can the president define, how can the president use that language to avoid notifying? This when possible. What can they cite that they cite repeatedly as a, as a reason for them to kind of act autonomously? But it's like secret if they can. Yeah. It's secretive. It be and, and by secretive, you know, what's expanded a little bit, we mean like um, it has to be secretive because if I reveal things to you, I'm going to put somebody or the nation in jeopardy. National security is at stake. What's the time frame? Days, minutes? 48 hours. 48 hours. So they're supposed to notify within 48 hours when possible, but we can cite national security and say not possible. Now, the president can continue to have troops um, in you know, combat or engaged or deployed um, for how long? without congressional approval. There's a timetable here. Yeah, and if there is no congressional approval, how long do they have to withdraw? 30 days. So they've got this kind of 90-day window um, that kind of have troops deployed without any specific con uh, congressional authorization. In the nature of modern warfare, depending on you know what the what the conflict is, that, that certainly can be enough. You know, the first Gulf War was a matter of, um, you know, uh, weeks in, in terms of how quickly it, it can, you know, the superior technology of the United States versus um, groups that aren't kind of matched against us can, can take. Um, alternatively, you could kind of, you know, redefine or um, shift the nature of the conflict. You know, you could use the, uh, the, the 90-day window and then say this is a different military encounter or engagement. Um, the last part is essentially um, negates these timetables. So what we were rushing through as we ended was the idea that Congress can say at any time, bring the troops home. So you would argue that the president has this 90-day window. Well, any time within that 90-day window or after that 90-day window, Congress can come in and say, we want them home. Again, that is, that's part of their lawmaking ability, right? But what does it sound like again? Congress is negating an action of the executive branch. What could the president potentially argue this is and therefore is unconstitutional that we just covered? Well, the, he would use the executive order to direct them. What would Congress be using arguably? What does this sound like if they're saying, hey, president, send them home, Paul? Yeah, it sounds like a legislative veto, and so there could be grounds for challenge there. Right? All of it's kind of a moot point because, again, even though this is on the books, if the Internet was up and working, um, again, I have a link that shows you every military encounter following World War II, our last declared war. And, uh, you know, there are countless uh, military engagements and, and quasi-wars that, that just, you know, go on and on and on. 
So obviously Congress defers to the president when it comes to waging war. We talked about that. The nature of war kind of demands executive action more than it does congressional action. You don't often have the time um, to deliberate amongst 535 members. Uh, sometimes you need to act swiftly. Sometimes the action we want to be accountable to one as opposed to Congress. Congress doesn't often want that spotlight. Um, you sometimes do need the secrecy that you know the executive branch allows. Um, Congress allows the president to wage war, and rarely will they call him on it and use the War Powers Act. All right. So from there, um, we were entering into our kind of our last phase. Um, and what I'm doing here, having you know, what I'm trying to establish is. Congress has obviously a legislative function. When you begin to think of their delegated powers, you begin to see uh, that legislative function in um, more specifics. You know, so for example, there's things that they can do to regulate and stimulate trade. There's things that they can do to um, uh, enhance foreign relations and foreign affairs. There's things that they can do to um, you know, create order and stability. Well, you know, what you have to do is think of the delegated powers and the types of delegated powers, and then you've got the types of ways that they can use their legislative powers. When we looked at the checks, we begin to think of their watchdog role. You know, part of their watchdog role is to keep an eye on the other branches. But remember, when you look at their committees as well, and especially the ability to create, um, you know, select committees, they have a, a broader watchdog role. You know, they may, uh, the um, fantasy football, silly example, but you see a lot of businesses kind of popping up largely unregulated. That's an area that you'd look for Congress to kind of start studying and investigating and coming up with recommendations. So you, you any kind of problem that pops up, uh, there are a group of policy experts that get together and can study it and come up with recommendations and if need be legislation. So they have this watchdog role. The final thing I want to look at in terms of their functions and powers um, are some of the trappings of power is too funny of a term, I guess. Um, there, were, there were perks, there are kind of um, benefits that surround the job. Uh, you know, some of my benefits are the technology and having a classroom. There are just kind of functions that surround them that they can use to their advantage. Um, and, you know, some of it may seem a little um, like a stretch, I suppose, but part of this is also developing vocabulary. So, for example, one of the kind of the perks, the benefits, the things that surround them is something called congressional immunity. Um, whether or not they use this to their advantage to really enhance their power is, again, I think beside the point. It's something you ought to be familiar with, uh, just even in terms of terminology. And what it suggests is that uh, congressmen are free of, uh, from arrest when traveling to and from legislative sessions. You see why I, I'm suggesting we might be bordering on the ridiculous here. Um, it, it sounds more like a, you know, a Hollywood movie where the congressman has you know, shot up somebody and then claims uh, you know, his, his version of diplomatic immunity um, and drives off to the Capitol building and is free from arrest. That kind of Hollywood version is, is not what I want you to picture. What I do want you to picture is that the um, power of arrest could be used as a political tool. Um, it certainly was in our historic past when you had loyalists and patriots um, kind of, you know, using um, extreme measures against each other. Uh, you know, arresting somebody based on the fact of their political identification. So because the power of arrest can be used as a political tool, and because they could be used to thwart a critical vote, we have this guarantee. So it's not like, yeah, there is a scenario where yes, a, a, a congressman could commit a heinous crime and claim immunity so that they could go vote, but they certainly would be subsequently arrested. <laughs> um, this does not free you from eventual arrest, it just simply is uh, a tool to prevent the detainment, um, to prevent the vote, if that makes sense. Okay, um, freedom of expression. We would not be a democratic body if you were not free to say what you needed to say down within the, the chamber floors. 
So what this frees you from is libel or slander. So you can get on the floor and you can say things that, you know, maybe if you put it in a newspaper or maybe if you said it um, in a boardroom, uh, could get you in trouble. You know, here, speech, depending on where the speech is given, has different kind of context and therefore restrictions. What I say in the classroom, what you say in an airport, uh, what you say in front of, uh, uh, you know, a group of school kids, it, it, that's different. So the, the, the degree of speech that we give people changes in terms of the, you know, the location. And on the congressional floor, it's about as wide open as you can get. Because, again, the idea is we're not democratic unless we do it that way. Right? Um, compensation. This is, you know, again... What we're just trying to look for is things that allow congressmen to do their jobs and do them more effectively. So certainly the, the, the kind of the license that they can feel to um, express themselves and, and feel free that they're not going to be punished and, and there's not going to be any reprisals, that's important. So is salary to a certain extent. Um, what I want to stress here is, you know, if you want the best of the best, sometimes the way to get that is to compensate. Um, CEOs make a tremendous amount of money. The question is often, um, are they worth it? And what you often find is some of the, um, there's a great study with Ben and Jerry's where they were trying to hire uh, a CEO, but they were trying to bring in a CEO with, in somewhere uh, percentage-wise that was in line with their regular workers. He was only going to get paid like 10 times as much. And the company didn't run well for a long time. And all of a sudden they went and they got the hired gun. They got the, you know, the guy that they had to pay, you know, uh, six figures for, more than six figures. And all of a sudden the company started running well. So there is this idea that money gets you talent. The argument with education often is you're not going to get the best of, and the brightest because uh, teachers don't make as much as people in the private sector. You have to kind of roll in our benefits and things like that. So there are ways to kind of consider that in a more sophisticated sense. Um, there is the altruistic factor in terms of teaching. Some people teach not just for the money, but the reward. But if you started paying six figures to teach, would you entice some people that are in the private sector into um, the public sector? And would you have better teaching? Same argument goes with Congress. If you look at their money, I don't know, it's pretty good. You know, members of the House and Senate um, have a salary set at around 160000 a year. That's pretty good money. Leadership makes more than that. You know, that's often the model. You know, principal should make more than a teacher. A superintendent should make more than the principal. Um, so they make more money. But again, if my links were working, I would begin to show you private sector money, which is jaw-dropping um, in terms of what people make. Uh, Bill Gates alone, uh, the richest man in the world, typically. Sometimes he gives a lot away, and Warren Buffett catches up, or there's a, uh, there's a guy in Mexico, and a, he's a telecommunications magnet, magnate uh, of sorts, and, and he often is kind of neck and neck with Gates. But, you know, um, Gates has, like, made up money, and, and you kind of see his net worth at, at $2 billion. Um, so Forbes, it, it's an interesting magazine. It... it um, it basically, you know, is a financial a source of financial expertise, and they have all these lists. And uh, I'll try to do it, you know, when the network's up. But it's fun to go in and see all that crazy money out there, and who's they list them, they rank them, and you can bet that Warren Buffett and Gates sometimes probably like, hey, I want to be number one. But they probably compete a little bit. Um, they also compete to give a ton of money away. So at any rate, the point I'm trying to make with this private money is. These seem like big figures until you think of money available in the private sector. And what I want to put you in the back of your head is, how do you keep somebody in Congress when that private sector money is available and they are going to be in demand because of their expertise? Every industry, every interest group out there wants a former congressman or senator because they're an insider. And they can figure out how to navigate the legislative process for them and get you know, laws and bills passed in their favor as a lobbyist, all right? So sometimes when you think that that's a lot of money, you have to think, is that enough money to retain people and get the best of the best, all right? So again, we're still just looking at things that enhance their ability to do the job. Um, speaking of that, uh, 
other kind of financial perks and restrictions that surround them. Um, it used to be that members could use their position and their status to give speeches, and you make a lot of money from speeches. All the ex-presidents go on the talking circuit, um, they write books, and they make a fortune. Um, certainly much more than they make when they're uh, in the office as president. So again, because of their status, um, there was all this uh, ability to give speeches and make extra money, and what people felt like is that's a conflict of interest. Should you be going to, you know, pick your interest group, the NRA, the Sierra Club, the, um, you know, uh, an environmental group uh, versus uh, an oil group? Um, and giving speeches. Does that mean you're too much in their pocket because they're paying you for the speech and do they want something in return? So there had been some restrictions on that um, in exchange for what's called the COLA increase. COLA stands for cost of living adjustment. Um, an important thing to kind of consider, um, when you guys are looking at retirement plans, and this is way, 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 way down the road, the money that you, know, you get from a retirement plan might seem pretty good when you first start collecting. But if that money is a fixed amount and it doesn't grow with inflation, uh, 10 years later, your retirement plan isn't enough to live on. So you wanna make sure sometimes that um, things have a cost of living adjustment in them, whether it's your retirement plan or um, other benefits that you receive, okay? So they kind of built it in. And a simple way of kind of referring to this is that we ought to look at our salaries occasionally and adjust them for inflation. It's a different kind of way of, of going about and getting a raise. Because a raise has to be um, after an election cycle. You know, they vote them, Congress gets to vote their own uh, salary. What would you pay yourself if you got to vote your own salary? The catch is the salary can't kick in until the next election cycle. You get the catch? Would you vote yourself like a million dollar raise and realize you'll never collect it because they'll vote you out the next year? So they found a kind of a trap door way to give themselves a little bit more money just as a cost of living increase. Um, they used to get all kinds of uh, perks too, you know, like, hey, come to Hawaii and talk to us and we're gonna give you a, a swag bag here. We're gonna give you um, all these kind of gifts and perks from the company. That seems like a conflict of interest. They ruled that out and we'll talk more um, we look at interest groups about what I mean by a revolving door. But again, what I said was everybody wants an ex-senator or a congressman. If I go into the House and Senate or Senate and I work for a couple of years and I go immediately into an interest group, it looks like um, I was never really a public servant in the first place. I was just looking to use the Senate and the House as a stepping stone uh, to that interest group. So for that reason, what a revolving door means is don't treat the Senate and House as a revolving door. Um, there has to be a waiting period in between when you stop serving in government and when you work for a particular lobbying group. Um, if it's directly related, it's a longer waiting period. If it's something tangential, it's a shorter waiting period. But the idea, I guess, is that, I don't know, if you're working on something critical, let's say, within defense, that's your subcommittee, you're on a... a an intelligence or a defense subcommittee, you couldn't go to work for General Electric or Rockwell International or one of these um, defense aerospace companies for a time frame. And potentially within that time frame, the kind of insider, uh, I'm going to call it proprietary, meaning kind of secret uh, intellectual property of the government, becomes less relevant. All right. What else? Well, um, you got to look at their working facilities, and I, I kind of was over this already. Um, they work. Uh, morning. Good morning. Is on. <laughs> well, what's up? On. Oh, okay. we're we're still in the intercom. All right. So, it. so you're public. I tell everybody. That that obviously was. I wonder if the black phone worked. Um, so you have this suite of offices. Um, again, I kind of described it as the senator or congress themselves have a nice kind of office, but outside of that is the main office, and it's a bit of a cube farm. Um, you have administrative assistants running the show. Um, you have a host of legislative assistants, legislative correspondents, interns running around and 
um, you know, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed and hoping to get some sort of credentialing on their resume and a job in government. Um, and all total, you've got about 44 members um, making up Senate staff and 14 members making up uh, House staff. They've got a lot of people that they can kind of draw on to do a division of labor. Um, one of the main functions, again, I mentioned of legislative correspondence is to respond to constituent letters, emails, tweets, uh, Facebook posts. They're going to use every bit of social media you can imagine. Why? Why do we respond to everything a constituent asks, whether it's a phone call or a letter um, or something electronic? What does every response equal? A vote, right? So there's people that are dedicated to that. And some of this, again, is becoming a little antiquated. But it, you know, that idea of the exchange between a member and um, a constituent, there shouldn't be any barrier to that. And for that reason, it's subsidized. The government essentially subsidizes the cost of correspondence um, between members and their constituents. So phone calls are kind of covered. Uh, the cost of postage is covered. Again, this is somewhat antiquated, but this we'll talk about in a second is traditionally a pretty good incumbency advantage. It's called the franking privilege. Um, you know, back in the in the medieval periods, the Franks, um, you know, had a had a, a seal, a symbol that they would affix to a letter, and it, it becomes um, the terminology references a stamp. You know, if you can kind of think of it that way. So the franking privilege is the ability to send out free postage. What I can do as uh, an incumbent is send constituents all kinds of mailings for free. Um, they can't be direct campaign documents um, saying vote for me because, but they can say, hey, there's a town hall meeting on such and such a date. It'd be great if you came and, you know, we're going to talk about the issues. Or uh, I need your support on the following issue. I've been fighting tirelessly about this issue. They can use the franking privilege to raise your awareness of issues where the member stands on it and just kind of their profile and name recognition, right? So that's kind of a significant one. Um, we mentioned the Library of Congress already and CRS reports. Um, I mentioned, you know, the other silly stuff. That, uh, again, if I could open up the links and show you the floor plan of the Capitol. There is all this subterranean level. There's actually trolleys that run from there are uh, working buildings that surround the, the Capitol. So there's on the Senate side, there's the Hart, the Russell, and the Dirksen, named for very famous senators. And you know, all the members have their offices there. On the House side, it's the Longworth, the Cannon, the Rayburn. I think those are the three. And there's trolleys. There's a little trolley that connects up from those um, buildings and runs to the Capitol to get them there swiftly. And while you're on that subterranean level, there's a gym, there's a place to get your hair cut, there's um, uh, medical facilities, there's cafeterias. Whenever I'm taking kids to, to D.C., that's like one of their most fascinating places, is to see that, I mean, you hate the cafeteria here, but let's go see one where the senators eat. Um, and they're fascinated by it. The reason I kind of bring all of this stuff up is because that's where a lot of the interaction socialization goes on. That's where a lot of the behind-the-scenes stuff happens. Okay, a um, couple other things that we want to talk about, and we're in good shape, uh, is incumbency. Because if we're focusing on things that give, you know, things within their working environment, I may have finally stumbled upon how I want to say it, things within their kind of working environment that enhance their ability to do the job, incumbency is certainly one of them. The act of holding the office certainly allows you to, to be more effective and to maintain that office. So incumbents, again, as we've stressed, have a tremendous advantage when it comes to re-election. They win 90 to 95% of the time. Now again, that is an average. It looks a little different in the Senate than the House. We've talked about the House having a little more consistent incumbency rate um, for all the different reasons, and the Senate's being a little more volatile. But on average, 90 to 95% of the time. Why? Well, there's a whole host of reasons, and I've set a lot of them up already. Um, one has to do with the fact that the member has greater name recognition than the challenger. And often we rely on that simple construct. It sounds awful, but when people go to the polls, often a way to navigate who they're going to vote for 
especially as they get to the more obscure positions, is what name do I know? Let's say it's a presidential cycle. Again, we have elections every two years. There's presidential cycles, and then there's the midterm uh, elections. In a midterm election, you're just voting for senators and congressmen, and you're only voting for a third of the Senate, right? And there's these other positions that are often in there as well. Well, what the heck do I do in a midterm election when there is no president to vote for? I go by name recognition. What do I do in a presidential cycle when the only name I know uh, and the only reason I went in the first place was to vote for um, a president? I go by name recognition. We like simple. We like things that make a complex decision easier, and name recognition is certainly one of them. Now, you notice in terms of what I'm, I'm writing here, um, I'm trying to get you to see what causes that name recognition in the first place. And what causes it is all the work that they do and how high profile it is. They consider thousands of bills. They sit on multiple committees. They attend multiple public functions. And public is the operating, operating word. Everything that they do is public. It's part of the written record. It's um, often televised, if you choose to kind of watch. And that builds up the name recognition. What it also, though, does is give them experience. So these two are kind of interwoven. When you're trying to make a decision between two people, and one has done the job and one has not, is that a deciding factor? If I'm hiring new teachers, I can either pluck someone fresh out of college who's never done the job, or I can hire someone with two, three, four, five, six years experience. And if money wasn't a factor, it often is, you know, who do you think I'd choose? There's more to that. Actually, sometimes I like the, the new person because I can shape them. Um, but all things being kind of equal, sometimes you want the person that can do the job. And they certainly have the experience here. Um, what I mean by that is, is little subtle things, like the idea of how to shape legislation, um, the timing in terms of how to introduce it and steer it to um, you know, the right conditions in terms of debate, the right committees, the right co-sponsors. Um, they have the right leadership positions. They know the complexities and all of the ins and outs of Congress that can um, help them secure passage of legislation. And on some level, you know they have that, and that's why you'd vote for them. Again, this is all interwoven, but as they get expertise, they also build a track record. Um, when you vote for somebody who is a challenger, you don't fully know where they're going to stand on a lot of contentious issues, you know, whether it's abortion or gun control or immigration or the environment, until they've actually voted. Whereas what I've said you can do with an incumbent is go to almost any, uh, you know, interest group or watchdog kind of website, and they have a report card on these individuals. They will show you. I mean, again, I try to show you the websites. You can go to the members' homepage, and you'll get a lot of this information. They make it very public where they, what they voted on and how they voted. And so you can make an informed decision on an incumbent. A lot of what we like about them, too, again, we have this, do you remember I said the approval rating of Congress is abysmal? Uh, you know, around 12%, you know, 12 of the American public approves of the, of the job Congress is doing. And yet they get reelected time and time again. So how can I hate the institution but reelect the, the guy from my district? Well, because he's bringing home the benefits, right? Um, benefits come in different forms. So one of the things that comes in is casework. When, you know, if you were to ever call up your member, a congressman, senator, and say, I need help with the following. Um, you know, I'm applying for a particular scholarship and I need a letter of recommendation. Um, there's, uh, they're, they're building a wind turbine in front of my house. Um, and it, it's having a health impact. Um, you know, the, the, our school is thinking of adopting uh, a hybrid version of Park MCAS, and I don't like it. You're going to get somebody within the office. It could be an intern who doesn't know what they're doing, but you're going to get somebody on, in the office looking to respond to you. Um, might be just in the form of a letter, and, and there was a formulaic approach we took. You know, thank you for your interest. Um, you know, this is what we're currently doing in terms of legislation. Uh, you'd find something related to what they're asking about, and this is uh, why we hope you'll vote for us and continue to support us in, in the October or November. Um, 
you'd have this formulaic response. But let's say you're a veteran and you're having trouble getting your benefits, or you're an elderly person having trouble getting prescription medicine. You might get somebody a little more um, higher up in the food chain working on that, and that's called casework. So on one level, somebody is going to respond to your constituent request, and often they will try to help you navigate the bureaucracy, like why isn't the VA um, giving you the, the medical treatment that you need as a veteran? And in that case, it's called casework. Another thing they do is they bring money to the district. Um, it goes by different names depending on whether or not we want to think of it derisively or not. So again, I talked about within legislation, um, members will figure out how to kind of tack on things for themselves. So when they were trying to pass Obamacare and it came down to a handful of states, those states as a trade-off got a little extra money for Medicare, Medicaid, excuse me, um, a little more help with Medicaid. And oh, all of a sudden they're gonna vote for Obamacare. Um, that's called an earmark, where you begin to kind of fold over a page of the book for yourself. If I think of it critically, I'm calling it pork barrel politics. Um, because again, what it's doing is it's using federal money to directly benefit a district, and the national benefit is um, hard to see. And often what we see it doing is going outside of normal budgetary kind of procedures. My argument, again, is if Congress doesn't kind of like tab money for themselves, well, then the executive branch is going to direct it. Someone will direct the money somewhere. And the question is, who do you want doing it? The money we're talking about isn't overwhelming in terms of a percentage of our budget. But we've got a big budget. It's $15 billion. Um, there's a Center Against Government Waste, and they... Uh, are a watchdog kind of advocacy group that tracks a lot of this. So this list is from them. And you know they, they basically kind of will look at it and say, did this money uh, get spent outside of normal budgetary procedures? Does it seem to benefit a particular district? And the national uh, benefit isn't quite clear. If so, they'll classify it as pork barrel politics. And by their numbers, it's around 15 billion uh, a year. And what you can see, um, is things like uh, money for an indoor rainforest in Coralville, Iowa, for 50 million. You know, does this promote some sort of environmental awareness? Does this help you know kids learn about nature? Probably, but it's 50 million of taxpayer money for this particular rainforest, you know, demonstration in Iowa. Um, money for various halls of fame, including 70,000 for the paper industry International Hall of Fame. You know, innovators and pioneers in development of paper. Is it an important industry? Do we want to promote awareness and, and um, uh, good feelings towards the paper industry? Certainly, we all still need it to a certain extent. How do you feel about that money? Um, there was a World Toilet Summit that uh, we wanted to go to. Now, this is on some level about water conservation, the amount of you know, water that, that toilets use, but it's a toilet summit um, that we're going to. Um, here's another one. You know, obviously toilets are a, a big concern here. There was a uh, million dollars for the water-free urinal conservation initiative. Trying to figure out again how to conserve water. Uh, wood utilization research. Maybe there's more things I can do than, than, you know, build houses out of it and make pulp paper out of it. What else can I do with wood? It floats. Uh, what else? You know, I've made boats. Uh, here's one for a teapot museum. Be, you know, okay, you know, that's jobs for somebody. That's uh, uh, preservation of American um, folk art, potentially. Tea is nice, I suppose. That's a lot of money. So um, think of what you can do, though, if you are a member and you're swinging this kind of money to your district for something like this. You're going to be hated uh, as an institution, loved as uh, you know, a member for your state. Okay, um, we only have a little bit left and we're going to wrap oh, up tomorrow in the long block, so we're almost done. Deal.